And once again, you have reached the real dirt. On today's dirt, I have John Numer of Flower Pot Genetics. We go through John's cultivation rescue and uh, how Greaseball and Silly Putty saved his life. Or at least maybe, like, uh, changed his perspective a little bit. Anyway, join us and we talk uh, micro-grow, growing technology, and kind of the future of California small growths. So stay tuned. Real Dirt. Today is my guest. I have a longtime friend, John Numerziki. He's commonly known as Numer in the Circles. He's an expert aficionado of fine cannabis. He's an incredible cannabis warrior. And wow, he has brought more of the finest weed than any other guest here at The Real Dirt. He has set the mark for cannabis at The Real Dirt Studio. So we'll, we'll go ahead and put your name up on the top there, John. <laughs> right. Numer of uh, brought the most cannabis to The Real Dirt. I'm the dude of weed. Ladies and gentlemen, the dude of weed, <laughs> Mr. John Numer. You know, I'd like to take the grease to another level. That's what I'm rolling right now. The grease ball. Grease ball. So John is a member of the uh, Flower Pot Genetics. They're medical growers that curate and breed fine cannabis. Right now, we're rolling up the grease ball, which is the winner of a local cannabis cup here called the Golden Tarps in Humboldt County. And man, I'm telling you, when you win a weed competition in Humboldt County, it absolutely means something. Well, we came in second to the Gorilla Glue. For the whole competition. For the whole competition. But first in floral. I mean, there's there's no denying the Gorilla Glue. I mean, it is it is what it oh, is. Let's, let's see the jar here. Don't just roll it up and tuck oh, it in the go. back. There you go. And I also brought you that. some. Oh, sweet. I put it in a berry jar. This is a grease ball. That's a gift for you. Oh, awesome. And then. Other guests take note. I came Here's across a, this I, he, box. He's just hand me a large, maybe quarter pound of, of weed here. It's an unmeasured <laughs> amount. It's uh, incredible. It's about the perfect amount. And then this is, I, I saw this box and I thought the silly putty looked like a nice coffin for oh, it. Oh, sweet. And there's an untrimmed nugget wow, in there it's for like you. A shoe box full of weed. <laughs> you next, you other guests, you're going to have to like. You have to pluck the leaves here. off that one yourself. But underneath it, there's some trimmed version of oh, it. Sweet. I just wanted to, you to see it they, in all, oh, its, yeah, it's glory. all its glory. Wow, there's not much leaf on that at all. Not That's much a beautiful at all. grower right there. I mean, the, the leaves fall off when you look at them. So. And what's the Silly Putty cross? The Silly Putty is the offspring of Greaseball. So when my buddy cracked the Greaseball seeds that he found in a pound that he got in Humboldt over a decade ago, origin of the weed unknown, but there was a bunch of seeds, and he took the time to crack them and sift through them and pick out the females, grow them, mother the ones he liked, and then save some pollen off a different pheno of it because there was multiple phenos when he cracked it. So he took the pollen from one pheno, crossed it with his favorite female, and got the silly putty, which is completely different. It doesn't get as purple. The smell is completely different. In the back end, there's a lot of gas. When you first hit it, it's kind of licorice sweet with gas. And, and what am I smelling here? This is the That is the grease ball. The grease ball. Wow. Well, this has a... Got a floral nose. Amazing wild grape, almost muscadine type smell in the back, and like a muscat grape. Mm. You know, musk is a good word for that because mm, yeah, and and it stinks up front, but it's really sweet. But it has that wild, like feral grape smell. Yeah, it's super white. So I'm sure like when they leave purple, it looks incredible. I mean, it's incredible looking weed right now. Yeah. Right around day 52 is when it starts getting its color. And it comes on like maroony, like a maroon color, silver. And then it starts getting darker purple. But the finished product with all the green and orange that comes through, it's like looking at a rainbow. And, uh, it's a rainbow of flavors. <laughs> it's a rainbow. It's uh, very visual. Let's get it straight, John. Somebody gave you this cutting. They found it in the back seed. You've been growing it, right? Since 2015. Select, it's a select cutting, right? Tell me how it is to like enter a cannabis competition. How it is? Mm -hmm. Well, my first opportunity to do so was the Golden Tarps 
friend of mine was actually headed down there to see Kevin. Figured light depth is pretty much what I consider the most prestigious way of growing. Like if you can mm-hmm. master light deprivation, you're that much closer to being a master. A little different from indoor, outdoor. Right. It's Absolutely. like a com- combination of manipulating the sun to work for you mm-hmm. and using what you have. You know, if you need to add a few lights to get you through those cloudy days that we see here in Humboldt a lot on the coast. It was another challenge growing on the coast of California because oh, yeah, absolutely. The, the conditions are not that It's favorable. always 50 degrees. You know? So they seem to like it inside the greenhouse, I feel like. Yeah, you heat it up a little bit, and they, yeah. they really do like it. The difference between the finished product and indoor, I mean, the indoor is so cracked out, and you know, we push it to a level that you can just take it far with, with, yeah, the, right. with the the actual sun coming into the play of light deprivation, it tastes that much better. Yeah, the, the plants absorb the nutrients in a different way under yeah. the sun, that's for sure. All the science aside, can't replicate the sun. Nope. And uh, you could taste the sun in there. And when I'm doing light dep, I like to time everything by the moon. So Wait a second, moon boy. This is this jar of weeds light dep? No, this is indoor. We're smoking. Oh, okay. Unfortunately, I ran out of uh, Your my light, depth. My light depth right. grease ball, but I have some silly putty. That's phenomenal looking. This did well at the Golden Tarps too. Oh my man! Uh, yeah, that's incredible looking light depth. It that's is, for sure. you know, and I, you know, it was above above market standards of Absolutely. everything I saw that was coming in. You know, oh man, that I mean, one hundred percent. That looks as good as any pampered indoor environmentally controlled environment yeah. and uh, scan i actually had problem with what i entered as far as the grease ball was because i found myself like at the very end of the cycle when i was getting ready to harvest i didn't get to put a good enough flush on it because all of a sudden it was like we're done so <laughs> i got one flush on it so it really so wasn't you, you didn't really prepare your cannabis for the golden tarp you I just didn't. like Pulled some weed out of the crop and well, it a, entered it. It was a last minute decision. Last minute decision. I saw okay. the opportunity. My friend Jen was going down there to see Kevin. So, mm-hmm. you know, I gave her two ounces of each and told her which category. And uh, she said that Kevin was there and uh, received the weed personally. And mm-hmm. as he took it from the jar and transferred it to his bag, he was like, wow, every connoisseur that's had the pleasure of smoking my product that was the first thing that was said was wow wow you know um, yeah i heard that uh leo stone smoked some of it and uh he said wow and uh kevin was wowed and <laughs> you haven't said wow yet so i'm a little offended but <laughs> oh man i mean <laughs> sorry so, so sorry i joke john numer humor <laughs> <laughs> You know how hard it is for me to be wowed, yes. right? But mm-hmm. you keep passing joints over here and open up bags. Well, who knows what happens? It's all about the curing. It yeah. is all about the curing. I see weed every single day. I see the biggest, best gardens, the most highly like technologically advanced, and then they chop that shit down and don't cure it right. Fuck yeah. it up. And the thing is, is when I was sending it down there, it wasn't exactly cured yet. But what saved me is it went down about three weeks before the competition. So it got there early. He transferred it from the jar to his bag. And then a couple of days before the competition, I opened a jar at home and I rolled a joint. As soon as I opened the jar, I was like, wow. And I rolled the joint and I smoked it and the taste was amazing. So it was finally cured. And I was like, he's going to open that bag down there for the judges. And they're going to be like, Wow. Because right. I was smoking it and all, I was wow. like, okay, I think we're going to win this competition. You know, that, that was little did I know that. Like, this is some good shit, man. <laughs> little did I know that Gorilla Glue was entered. You know, right. That's the, of course it was. the skyscraper of weeds. I've got nothing bad to say about Gorilla Glue. No, oh, I know. It's great, great cannabis. And I'm sure the, a fine example of it was grown and entered into this competition, too. Yeah. And it was, uh, I believe, uh, Emerald or an off company of emerald apparently the guy that grew it is the best i mean i've heard Mm -hmm. people talking about him that can't think of his name right now but uh that they'll only smoke his weed and you know that's kind of how i want to be known in Mm -hmm. the industry like because a lot of people do seek out what i grow and 
once they get some of my product, they're like me. I only want to smoke my weed. It's very rare that I'll save someone else's product and have it be in my little repertoire of things to smoke. But there are some growers out there that I respect and look up to. Most of them are in Humboldt County. You know, I do have a friend. Lots of heady growers up here, that's for sure. Lots of heady growers, you know, but, Mm -hmm. you know, it's also been like a highly trafficked area. There's a lot of bud that comes out of here that's just, it's just there. Yeah, it's just regular weed. In the market. Right, yeah, totally. Market standard, market standard. So uh, let's talk grow technique, dude. Give me your standard. How do you do it? I'm pretty old fashioned. Just dirt. I use soil. Well, cocoa, which you turned me on to. I think I was actually in the room when your Royal Gold, before you even had that name, I believe, was just like your. <laughs> just an idea. It was your bun in the oven at the time. Mm-hmm. You know, I think we were sitting over there on Cochrane Avenue where our friend lived. And uh, God. You were just getting the ingredients shipped from. Where did you get that stuff from? Sri Lanka. <laughs> Sri Lanka. Mm-hmm. So I was there. And, uh, of course, I had no money to invest at the time. We always knew that, you know, I was just there. <laughs> so I, I actually saw it be born. And then when your product actually hit, I was so proud of you and like just kind of amazed at how you just go get what you want. You know what I mean? And you had this idea. Nobody was growing in cocoa fiber at that time. I mean, that that was your idea, Chip, right? There wasn't another product out there like, hey, we're going to grow in coconut I, fibers. Other people were doing it, but I right. definitely had a vision for the marketplace okay. at the time, for sure. Well, Wait, what year was that, man? That well, was 2003. 2003. April. April. Yeah. I'd already started. I had a shipment in. Yeah, and I just got yeah. here. And, yeah. uh, you know, I had lived in Humboldt back in like 1990, briefly. My first time in Humboldt, I fell in love with this place. Um mm-hmm. The redwood trees driving on the highway, they just they look like little or giant buds coming out of the hills. That's right. I was doing a lot of mushrooms at the time. So. <laughs> no, I've had that vision before too. It's like every tree I think I see becomes a bud to me. Yeah. Every tree so, I think So I we see. start with the uh cocoa. We like the cocoa. And uh you know, Royal Gold was the cocoa that I prefer the most. And, yeah. Tuper, that was a that was a good one, and uh, now I believe they have the King's Mix, which was your idea, and I just adore that product. It's like you're you're ahead of the game opening a bag of that and uh, putting your cut in that and just letting that do the work for the first month, and then you know uh, as far as nutrients go, I love the Primordial Solutions. It was a good one. The uh, what is that? Sea Green and uh, Bloom. Oh, sure. I also use... Um, also out of... Uh, is that the Arcata one? Or the Grass Valley? I first discovered it in uh, BLC. The, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, Arcata. Yeah, over there by Water Beneficial Park. Living Beneficial Center. Beneficial Living Center. Those guys are great. Mm-hmm. Um, I yeah, use... lots of organic growers up here, man. Yeah. More here than any place else in the country, for sure. Yeah. I kind of mix it up. I'm not... Roots Organic, too. Roots Organic. I remember that one. I used to do that one, but uh, I didn't like it as much as that. Uh... Uh, oh, I guess guess I didn't mean to uh, uh, <laughs> mix up that name, Roots Organic. but uh, That's a soil, isn't that it? That is a soil, but like organic in a roots technique anyway like yeah. an old school technique yeah, it's the one with the camouflage bag on it isn't it that that is that is yeah those are cool yeah you know? yeah cool it looks cool man one thing i'd like to see royal gold do is uh, i know that they got that big 20 pound bag of uh that you can just open up and throw your your plant in that's if you want a plant that big because right. i mean i grow on the coast so I'm very cautious on the size that I want to get them because of bud rot issues. Yeah, absolutely. And, but uh, that's another reason I love the grease balls because the grease ball and the silly putty, they get big and they they fight off everything. Like really, it's in their genetics to fight off mold and everything. It's just so strong. You see it like if, if any issues arise, you see it fighting through. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I hope that maybe Royal Gold will come up with a five-gallon bag that you can just open and plant. Put that your would, plant in it. That, yeah, would, that would help me out will. a lot. <laughs> maybe they will. You know, uh, they've grown substantially since I sold that business out. They're doing great. I'm yeah. really proud of them. Proud to see the product everywhere. 
yeah, throughout Humboldt County. I'm so glad you're using it. Yeah. And, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll mention it over there. Nothing but props to your company that you started and that they're continuing it. And uh, they show a lot Thanks, of love man. to this community. Thanks, they sponsor a lot of events. I believe the Golden Tarps is one of them. Mm-hmm. I unfortunately didn't make it down there to accept my awards. I was uh, kind of busy not being able to get a ride, and I had a poker tournament to win. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that, that, yeah, that's a whole 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 other story. So, a uh, cocoa. So you start in cocoa, cocoa, right? And, Kings mix, uh, uh, Kings all mix, the way. some type of cocoa blend, yeah. uh, perlite or cocoa base, and then you use uh, straight water, some organic amendments, and straight water. Yeah, I don't I don't amend the Kings mix because it's perfect the way it is. As far as uh, nutrients, I like Sensational Solutions is a good one, too, for organic. Mm -hmm. If you mix that with the Primordial Solutions, it's a, it's a great mix. But um, I'm a house and garden guy, and uh, since they moved to Humboldt, I mean, the product is just a little bit better than it used to be. And I know I, <laughs> I, I could probably what happened get a lot that of... joint, man? Get, it, it went out. Did it go out? Yeah, let's you back, that back up. There you go. It's just great, man. Yeah. I'll this roll is the grease ball. In this is the grease ball. But um, as far as uh, house and garden, yes. And they moved to Humboldt. I mean, I might get a little crap from other growers about using house and garden because, I mean, you know, it's just pretty much straightforward. You so just, do you use their, uh, just their base nutrient, their, huge, their whole line? I use the A and B. And I also, I use Roots Accelerator very sparingly. That kind of smells organic to me, that Roots Accelerator. Mm -hmm. Plus, mm -hmm. like, you know, eventually some mold will get on the cap. I mean, organic things mold. So I know the whole line is not organic, but I use the butt no, cell. Right. I use the butt cell, cell, and I was told there's beeswax in there, in the butt cell. Well, I'm not sure if that's... I'm I'm, unsure, I'm unsure, John. I didn't research it, but I noticed that cap when you when you unscrew that cap for a while, some crystallizes on there and uh, kind of looks and smells like beeswax a little bit. They've got great product, that's for sure. Yeah, we sell tons of their product at uh, Cultivate Colorado. Yeah, I like a product called Moab, Mother of All Bloom, very sparingly mm -hmm. in the sixth week. Uh, zero fifty thirty, zero yeah. fifty forty. So. First week of flower, one time. And then in the sixth week, mm -hmm. one small dosage of that. And yep. then one dosage. I never like to overdo it with that top shooter, but I uh, use the liquid version of that. One dosage of that after the Moab and then flush for the next two weeks. Everything that's in those two products for that high phosphorus boost. They have it. It's going to carry you to the end. Yeah, you know? right. I mean, you could add more if you want some space age looking stuff. I like to keep it realistic. Jolly ranchers growing on the weed, you know, like that. Too crystally. Like, right. You know, try to keep it realistic. Keep it like we could look at it and try to decipher if that was organic or. Mm. But as long as you get a good flush on the end. So tell me what the difference is between in the marketplace. Can you tell organic weed versus synthetically grown weed i could pick out the organic weed by flavor in the mm -hmm. end like i don't know we're smoking this what do you taste because this was grown exactly how i just uh yeah i mean it. you know it tastes like house and garden weed grown right should yeah how about that yeah sure. <laughs> but i wouldn't call it organic weed no no it looks great though that's for damn sure yeah that's one right. thing about that you know let's face it this industry is a lot about visuals lately Oh, absolutely. My goal is to move to strictly organic once I get it down. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like make my own tea. Mm -hmm. You know, those products like Primordial and Sensational Solutions are mm -hmm. they're great. You know, you don't have to use much of it. Yeah. You know, you Everybody, notice it. Everybody's got their opinion of it, but I believe that just mostly organic and then just a little bit of synthetic goes a long way yeah right yeah so and we're on the like same environmentally page. like sensitive you know you're putting in some supplements that's what you're doing you're giving like three or four different supplements yeah right zero yeah. fifty thirty that's phosphorus potassium and then top shooter that's also potassium i think yeah that stuff is just whew, amazing mm -hmm. like watching it like as soon no, as but excel you don't use that product no i use but excel, but excel that, okay. that's the one I, I that they claim is there has beeswax in it which... oh, okay right because it's a combo but excel then top 
shooter. Yeah, just right. very, right. very sparingly with that stuff because mm-hmm. if you overdo that, your your stuff's going to finger out royally yeah. and look like not. I mean, there's no question it's not organic after that, you know. <laughs> but uh, you know, some of the trimmers get a little frisky and will trim all those heads off for you on the table in the end. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah. So, I mean, it what, t- what size me. containers are you in? The biggest I like to go in the McKinleyville coastal area is seven gallons. Right. Bigger than that, I mean, you're risking losing your final product. Right. Because it needs the, 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 the container needs to dry out quickly and yeah. you need to keep the plants a little smaller. And that, that putty really, it really grows great on the coast. I mean, it's almost like it's home. When my friend gave me these strains, he wanted me to take them back to Humboldt because this is where he got them. He doesn't live here anymore. He lives in Colorado. So he's like, I want to give you these strains to help you get your life back together. Because at that point in time, I was really struggling. I was involved in a, a big law dispute, which, you know, I'll get into with you later. But um, he was like, he saw his friend struggling and he gave me a cut of each one of greaseball and one of silly putty. And he's like, you know the rules. Don't give these to anyone. This is for you. He's like, I want you to get your life straight. And since that day and uh, since my return to cultivation and like actually having a couple of strains that I could be very enthusiastic about, it just opened up a whole new ball game for me. I mean, these strains really are a gift from my friend. And I believe he was gifted from God, these strains. I'm a pot snob. As I imagine you are too. Yes, there's, yes. There's not yes, much out is. there that wows me, right? Um, but these really do wow me. Man, this is an incredible weed. Thank you. Know? I mean, thanks for sharing. I really do appreciate it. If uh, everybody cared as much about it and grew it of this high quality, wow, it would be a different game changer. So, hey, John, let's. I think it's a perfect place. Let's take a break for a second. We're going to be back, and we're going to hear all about John's story and the cultivation rescue. Alrighty. This is the real dirt, Chip Baker, John Numer. Good buddy John Numer here, grower of the grease ball and the silly putty, winner of the first floral and first fuel in the Golden Tarps world this year, second in the whole competition. And man, this stuff is great. If if you ever see it, get it. It's almost gorilla glue. Oh, it's, it's <laughs> really good. The grease ball is really, really good. Well, we want to eventually cross the grease ball with, with the, the gorilla glue, glue and call it like the glue ball. The glue ball. <laughs> <laughs> gorilla grease. How about that one? You mentioned something in the break, man, and I just wanted to break this thing out here. I just got this really cool book. Um, It's called uh, Plant Songs. And uh, it's a, a collection of stories about individual plants and relationships to the plants. There's a psilocybin chapter. And uh, you said something during the break, John. I just thought I'd have to uh, break it out here. Let, let me read this one little couple sentences here. Okay. And uh, again, <clears throat> this book here, it's uh, Plant Songs, Reflection of Herbal Medicine oh. by Jessica Baker. Wow, L-A-C. another hero of mine right there. Yeah, right. There we go. So, spiritual evolution. Psilocybin mushrooms like to fuck with me. Even before they've made it through my digestive system, they beckon me to take more. So sometimes I do. Mm. Only to remember I should have waited for that first tasting to kick in. The cycle continues. And each time I remember that I should have waited to see how strong they would be. At some point, I tell myself not to listen to them and that I don't have to take it anymore. Little tricksters they are, having integrated into our lives and our culture a millennia ago, transforming our language, culture, and spirituality each step of the way. Wow. 
Yeah, totally. Mm. Super heady, bro. Talking about mushrooms, I mean. Yeah, totally. That's a, a whole different medicinal chapter. Holy. When I was there retrieving those strains in Colorado, my friend and I, we ate a little mushrooms before all that. So it's all intertwined. You well, know. I saw you take um, that you were microdosing. I do. You know, you're, from you're time, a From time to time, I kind of got to respect the fungus. You know, over the past few years, I've been so anxiety ridden. And, you know, psilocybin is maybe a cure for that. But when you're as anxiety ridden as I was, it kind of counteracted the productivity of taking it. It would make me a little more anxious on yeah, the, uh, the onset. So I put it down, but... Uh, Kind of like at a point in my life now that I can just enjoy and uh, know that anxiety is still there, but it's not as bad. So I, I can I can deal with the, the psilocybin now. And yeah, I, man. Them psychedelics get on you. You know? That anxiety comes out, that's for sure. But uh, a lot of things unfold to you just if you take the smallest amount. Any person walking and passing on John on the street would have no idea he was a, a psychedelic uh, warrior over here. He's a... Uh, Wearing an an Owsley Grateful oh. Dead split head uh, belt buckle around oh. his neck with a, a glad another, you noticed that another yeah. large crystal. Of course, I did. And I actually made that. That's glass. Uh, oh, sweet. Yeah, that's yeah. sweet. Yeah, I'm also, a glass blower in my spare time. I noticed you have a bronze. Yeah, there's a bronze, bronze Owsley. I just got this back. This uh, mm, wow. I got this in like uh, 2004 or five. I remember, I missed that deal, man. Mm, we got them in the mail straight from Owsley. You guys all got one. I missed that one. But I, I gave this one to my brother. My brother passed away uh, yesterday. It was actually the uh, ninth anniversary of his death, right. and uh, I had a lot of turmoil back in uh, 2013, and I had to give up this buckle for money to just live so my friend purchased it for a thousand bucks and kept it nice and clean and shiny till i was able to afford it back which was just a couple of weeks before christmas so this is just fresh back and <laughs> i put it on my neck and uh yeah my brother kept it good for me for a while and then my friend lois kept it for me for a few years now and uh, she was happy to give it back and she blessed it too so things are looking up <laughs> Sweet man, I, I uh, I've, I've always wanted one of those. Yeah. What kind of stuff are you breeding? Um, let me you see. Said, you said Gorilla Glue. You were putting. In... Well, I just had the idea of the a idea fancy of... name. Oh, I, right. I do like Gorilla Glue uh, a lot. It's a good strain. It's maybe a little too high in THC for me. I'd have to smoke a lot of that to get used to it. So, what's your what's your like ideal like thing you'd want to breed for? If you were going to breed like today. You know, plant a bunch of seeds to cross or to plant out. What, what what would you look for? What would you be interested in? I'm looking for strains that are going to advance our society medically as far as give cures for certain mm -hmm. things. Or uh, like the grease ball, I would recommend to any artist. And each strain has a different purpose. Mm -hmm. you know, like train rack is old, reliable for motivation and get things done. So it's a daytime thing. Mm -hmm. Not to mention probably the countless medical ailments it could treat. But the grease ball, a lot of that train wreck shines through. And when you hit this, you know, it's a hybrid, so it's 50-50, sativa, indica. I'm not sure the ratio exactly, but this is a motivator. So when I smoke this, I blow glass or I play drums or I write. But on the other hand, you could also go to sleep on this, but that's where the putty comes in. Mm -hmm. Putty is a nighttime kind of close the deal kind of strain, you know, helps you sleep, rid you of anxiety and uh, very aromatherapy kind of body high that you would get from a cush, you know. Wait, is that a, do you just roll up the silly putty? This is the silly putty. Yeah, pass some, some of the dry weed over here. Mm -hmm. Flower, bro. Yeah, that's my uh, light depth. flower. I kind of just stumbled across that, that light is, depth the other that day. Is, that I, is pretty. I didn't know I saved it, so I was stoked. It was like Christmas all over again. It was in my yeah. cabinet, and I opened it. I was like, oh. If there's anyone out there who thinks that you can't have the dankest weed on the planet in light depth, you're wrong. I would say that 100. percent I'm just going to tell you you're wrong because I'm looking right now at some of the best weed on the planet today. I get to see it. I get to smoke it. It's right here. 
Like, I would put this up against anybody's weed anywhere in the world right now. Well, coming from you, that means a lot. Because yeah, I mean, it really is perfect weed, dude. Look that's at it. what we're trying to do here, you know? We're trying to get renowned like that. And we're not in it for the money. We're, at this point, it's like, I've been in it not for the money for so long that I just mm-hmm. imagine that's, that just comes, you know what I mean? If you just stay true to who you are and, trying to put things i'm trying to put things out there that are going to wow people that's a wow that, people that's like a wow you, and i mean. know i know we had a whole wow thing earlier but now that for light depth that really is premium and i already yeah. told you that before that's really so i mean you got a light depth secret you, you know is there like is there is there something that makes it still like look lots of light depth just looks like outdoor you know what i'm saying i've seen that yes right, um, right. Like, you want it you, to look like you, indoor how do you make it look like you're in, i don't you know, i don't use things. much supplemental light either i might have one thowie and I, I grow small so my greenhouse i have two greenhouses that are only nine by 15 mm-hmm. and i could fit 50 plants in there in seven you know sometimes i go less so like give them their room but uh dry air because you got to be running those dehums all night long mm-hmm. when the fog rolls in and you got to zip them up. You got to be on top of it when the fog rolls in unexpectedly. You got to zip them up, crank those dehums, give them the supplemental light, mm-hmm. to keep them awake. You know, wake them up in the morning with some supplemental light, and then let the sun do its work. And uh, be on time with your tarps. And uh, there's little tricks to manipulating the light when you need to. When I'm just flipping, I like I like to give them a little more light. But not much, maybe a half hour at the most for like a week. So it lets them just to continue to veg to grow into that budding explosion that's about to happen. Then I get it to exactly twelve twelve. Mm-hmm. Then I'll cut it, give it a little more darkness, not much. We're talking fifteen minutes to thirty minutes in the end to help it finish. Mm. And, Flower force and, and manipulation. I, I find that you could do that in indoor successfully too. And I stumbled upon that by accident. What do you think you achieved doing this? Achieved by doing light depth? Well, no, by like manipulating the light. Like you're instead of just going twelve twelve. Well, it's like a it's like a discovery process, you know. Like I found that when I did give it more light in the first week or two of flipping it, that it actually produced a bigger bud in the finished product. Very healthy, strong, bigger bud. So that's that's one little secret. I don't do that all the time. We we mostly just go twelve and twelve. But sure, you like to you like to tinker with it, you know? Yes, yeah, just a little magic R and D there. Yeah. Uh, so I, I mean, it, it it you're on the coast in a little greenhouse. You've got just a little bit of supplemental light. You control your environment in a certain way. You set your temperatures and humidities in any type of way. You know, I I kind of just let it adapt to that environment and get used to it and you know like the grease ball and the putty just they just have this voodoo in them that helps them push through they adapt to a climate and make it their home and you know like i mentioned keeping that air dry when you need it to be dry and moving you want Mm -hmm. you know you need air constantly moving in there and uh warmth at night and Mm -hmm. the the dehums provide that on the You know, over the past decade or so here in Humboldt, uh, global warming has kind of been benefiting us, you know, like as you see the rest of the planet burning and flooding. Yeah, Yeah, you're right. You know, today we are in the uh, Molecule Studios in Humboldt County, California. It is January 5th, 2018. We should be freezing. Friday. (laughs) I have on shorts and vans and a hoodie, my outfit, I'll call it. Right. <laughs> right. It's very pleasant, pleasant day. John has on some like running pants and running <laughs> shoes or something. Yeah. You know? Yeah. This is uh this is my wardrobe. But uh I mean it's like fall here or late spring or early, all the time. You know, like winter. I hope it comes because you know, I want to do some indoor and uh, I don't want my room to be hot. <laughs> right. I want that cold air outside so I can you know, really crank the gavitas and get them up. You know what I mean? Can't do that with this kind of weather, you know, not without uh, you know, modifying my ventilation. Yeah, totally understood. So, uh, yeah, you're a micro grow. 
you're a small guy. I like to keep it small, and that's kind of a right. secret to the quality that you see. It's like, you know, not going overboard. Absolutely. You know, you stuff them in there too tight, and they suffer. Give them space and quality, not quantity sometimes. So California's changing. Everything's changing right now. Yes. Right. We're going to a, a different type of regulations for medical and recreational growing. There's lots of, of fear and lots of talk out there that the small guy's not going to make it. I don't believe that. I believe that smaller people have less operating costs. They're, they mom and pop it. Larger operations, they have way more costs of operation. And they can't, you know, it's hard for them to grow quality at a really large operation. And you have to bring more people in. Got to bring more people Maybe in. Maybe people that you might not. Wind up trusting in the end. Yeah, or being able to do a good job at the there mm. that you know what you require them to do. Micro business, you could keep it very family oriented and mm-hmm. just keep a tight knit. And there's tons of micro businesses all over the world for all different types of things. Yeah. Even though like Kinkos and FedEx really have you know took over like the printing shop business, they're still printing shops and. Yeah. In town, other, you know, private printing shops. Costs a little more, you know what I mean? But you're paying for that quality and service, mm-hmm. you know, and mm-hmm. real connoisseurs understand that. Yep. You know, and like to get compliments from you is like, it's really like, that's what we're looking for out of this whole thing. Like we want our strains to take over the world. And as far as like being <laughs> in the top, <laughs> top like onslaught of uh, strains that, People will notice and respect or even research medically. Are there genetics available of this stuff? Are there seeds available of this stuff? Um, You guys got plans for that? Well, the thing is, is uh, I'm only working with the grease ball and the silly putty right now. The guy that gave it to me, he's actually the master breeder. And uh, he's got maybe a hundred different variations of this strain. Mm -hmm. And it all, all things lead back to the grease. That's the origin. Right. And it's Humboldt native strain. So he's since he's crossed the silly putty and the grease ball back together to each other. So it's inbred now, and he calls that the flower pot. Wow, this tastes incredible. The mm. silly putty, right? It's like a licorice kind of fuel. Or holy shit, it tastes my. It almost it takes my taste buds away. It could taste like silly putty if we knew what silly putty actually tastes like. I think it's a good name for it too. You know, we we nickname it just the putty. And so he's got, you know, the putty is really the strength of the genetics. Like once the grease ball was crossed back with itself and you know, the putty is actually the backbone of the gene pool. So he took that and he's crossed it with 98 Bubba Kush. He's got the uh, putty crossed with the grease ball, which we call Flower Pot. And I thought that that was a great name for the company. Flower pot genetics. Oh, man, this is so good. I don't even want to pass it on. It <laughs> you like can hang on to that. For no, that's while. good. Here, I got to pass it because there's <laughs> an ash on it. Yeah. Let me ash that. That's why I came up with the name of Flower Pot for the company. And we're looking to start a micro business farm or you know something small. We don't want anything too big. But we, then we would like to pass the genetics on to the public through seed, probably. And maybe there'd be a spot that people could pick up cuttings. You know, um, we're trying to keep it a little close to the vest right now, but I'm... Uh, Man, this shit's great, dude. How many? How long does it take? This putty takes nine to ten weeks. Um, in, in light down, nine to ten weeks. Well, on the coast, you can cut off a week usually on the mm-hmm. coast of California. It's just a little different ball game. God, I mean, I still taste it. That's such a it's full good. flavor. It's got a nice back weed. end. Holy shit. Right? It, it, it tastes the gas in there, the fuel. It's like that Kim dog and... uh when it grows, it resembles I mean, OG Kush and sour diesel. Even it's very like my the the effect that's going on in my mouth is very like a sour like effect, right? Like yeah. a, a wincing like it's got that sour diesel, sour in it, but it's feeling to it. It is tasty. I mean, mm. part of it is like so syrupy, like a ta- like that. There's like this oil that's on my. All on the inside of my mouth and my lips. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Sticks to your lips. It's very sticky. It tested this particular stuff we're smoking right now. Tested total cannabinoids, I believe it was right around 27. But I think it was 23 THC. It had a half a point of CBD. The grease ball had a full point of CBD, which was mm. shocking to me. And uh, both strains also had some CBN, which I'm not clear exactly what that is, but. 
not too many of the other strains had that. So mm-hmm. that's got to be a plus, and that's that's got to be some sort of medicinal value. In oh man, yeah, that's great, dude. So, I was really thrilled about the testing. You made this reference earlier. You said that somebody gave these plants to you to change your life. To get it, get my life back get together. You, I'm interested in the story. Tell me what was going on. Well, my life kind of fell apart in uh, 2013. And a little before that, I was already in some trouble. In late 2012, my home got raided, unfortunately. And it was a sad thing, but uh, that wasn't the end of the world. But it kind of kind of bankrupted me a bit. And uh, I'm a professional mm-hmm. poker player. I mean... Let's not claim that. I'm actually a very good poker player that likes to play and would like to be a professional. But No, man, I, I see you be winning money yeah. and shit uh, like that. You know, I've been gambling about that 10 good solid years. That but... makes you a professional. You're just, he, 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 he makes a living uh, gambling cards. What's your, what's your game? Texas Hold'em. Texas Hold'em. No he, limit. Yeah, no limit. Texas Hold'em. He yeah. makes a living. Playing kind of a jack of all trades. He uh, makes a living playing Texas Hold'em. <laughs> so you know, on the corner, I throw some dice too sometimes. Yeah, of course you're a Georgia boy, so you're throwing some dice in the corner for sure. I'm actually very hot with the dice right now. <laughs> but uh, Texas Hold'em's kind of in the toilet at the moment. You know, it's like it goes in waves, but. Uh, mm-hmm. Right about the time we're talking about, I definitely had been gambling about 10 good solid years. So mm-hmm. I figured it might be time to take the show on the road. <laughs> mm-hmm. So yeah, like a partner of a friend of mine, colleague in poker, and I took a road trip. This is in 2013? 2013. You know, I was trying to kind of like lick my wounds from the cannabis industry invasion that I suffered and, uh, you know, make some money the honest way. Mm-hmm. Cheating people out of it in a poker game. Right. <laughs> I wouldn't say cheating, but tricking. Playing, playing, yeah, people. outplaying, outplaying, get, getting people. lucky. You know, yeah, it's a good sport. It's like life, poker. So we were out in uh, Chicago. Was our first stop. We played at uh, in Joliet. The Blues Brothers are from. Oh right, Joliet Jake. Which uh, that was a trip. I uh, went in that casino and played some dice and had a successful session, but then. I sat at a game in Chicago that night that went to the wee hours of the morning, and there was a guy just bleeding money. He was wearing a Cubs hat. And, you know, I was like, all right, so I like this profession. This is good. This guy's got money to burn. I need money. And we were like flies at the table. just Taking, taking it. Taking money. So we had a good session in Joliet, and then we went to uh, Philadelphia. Which, uh, what was the name of that casino? It was another Harrah's. Uh, I can't think of the name, but traveling town to town. We were there for about ten days gambling, and uh, did very well. I was really liking the poker trip, and uh, you know, we had a little money on us. And uh, traveling home with it, we uh, stopped back in Joliet again because that game was so good. We just had to get one more taste of that one. And uh, leaving there, we got on the road, and we were going through Iowa, and. A cop decided to stop me for some reason. Maybe it was the Nevada plates. I don't know. But uh, anyway, it was uh, that was the beginning of the end, uh, or so it seemed like the end. But it was the beginning. So we were hassled on the side of the road. You know, I'm no stranger to cops. So like, you know, I kind of knew that this guy was trying to trick me. All right, you know, mm-hmm. I, we we didn't have any weed on us or anything like that. So like. I'm I'm not worried, you know what I mean? I had my bankroll, which was 15000 and the guy that I was traveling with, he had a larger bankroll, but he's, you know, he is what you would call a professional poker player. If you want to talk about someone that grinds out their rent, bills, everything, you know, pays their insurance, I mean, that's by IRS standards a professional. So he's good, so he's mentoring me some comfortable playing poker around him and when you travel with that kind of company you tend to play to their ability kind of like that anyway this cop he was uh not too friendly and he uh did everything he possibly could to lie you know his reason for pulling me over was that i didn't use my blinker 
which I did. I'm a habitual blinker user. Hey, yeah, HBU. I, that's I mean, we've always called you H, old HBU <laughs> Numer. Yeah, habitual blinker Numer. That's me. Mm-hmm. So I did use my blinker, and I know that, but I can't prove it. So I'm going through the motions with this guy. I could tell he's just trying to lead me down this dark alley somewhere. And uh, he talked to me for about 30 minutes in his car, gave me a little warning, told me I was free to go. I was like, all right, cool. Nice meeting your officer. Got out of the car, going back to my car. He decides to get out of his car at that time and uh, approach me again and bombards me, which I've learned. It's kind of a tactic they use to just, you know, get you a little upended. They they tell you you can go and then yeah. they reapproach. Yeah, yeah it's absolutely. Kind of, it's kind of a tactic they're taught. So he comes right with some questioning. He's like telling me, "Hey, John, I noticed your stomach was uh, rumbling there and this and that. You seem a little nervous." It's like, "It's got a couple more questions. Can I uh, can I search the car? Oh, you got any money in there? Or weapons?" Or he's like, "No, sir. <laughs> like I don't have anything like that." And uh, I was like, "I I don't consent to a search. I prefer to be on my way." So. He's cool with that, and he's like, well, i got a dog up the way. Uh, I can just bring the dog by and you know, let him run around the car. And I was like, well, do I have the right to say no to that? And he's like, you do. So I, you know, I was like, I prefer to be on my way, as respectful as possible. So he decided he was just going to do it anyway and put me in his car. And, uh, so they brought a dog, and the dog hid on the car, and, you know, they never found anything except, you know, our bankrolls and they decided they were going to keep it, and they decided they were going to try to tie it to crimes here in Humboldt because that's where we're from. And everybody knows that that's where, you know, good weed is. And so, you know, right then is when it, it just all went south for me in life, and uh, they raided my home in Humboldt again, and they raided my friend's home as well. And we were both by the book. And, you know, we, we didn't have anything crazy going on. It was, I had a medical garden within my limit. And they took it again, and they took my strains. You know, it's kind of like a joke to them, but I came back to nothing, you know. And, you know, stories were fabricated that of stuff I had in my house that wasn't actually the case. So I was tarnished. And- yeah, because uh, when, the, when, the, when the police here, here in, in, in Humboldt County in the past and in other places now and in the past, they have the standard thing they say about people when they bust them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and that's what you're talking about is yeah. like they, you know, kicked down your door. They were like a known suspect with a commercial cannabis operation. Yeah. You know, <laughs> well, they never like released that. my name and I was grateful for that. For some reason, I don't know why they didn't do that, but I was grateful. I wasn't blown up like that and no pictures or anything of me. Oh, this is great, great weed. God damn, dude. Yeah. Appreciate that. And, uh, you know, so to have my home raided for the second time and, less than six months i mean god i'm in like shit's door right now <laughs> like, i don't know what to do the anxiety is crazy mm-hmm. you know I'm, I'm being charged with six felonies throughout the two cases other people are being dragged along anyway it was just like and you had hardly any weed at your house medical quantities no yeah hardly any at all i mean they tried to say i had 50 pounds of processed marijuana it was nowhere near anything like that mm-hmm. I didn't know where they got that that was just a flat out lie they just made it up so you know that's all that's all just red tape you know the lawyers handle that later they just want to make you look bad mm-hmm. so they were doing a good job at that but um mm-hmm. you know the next several months were stressful you know i hired a lawyer local lawyer everybody loves and adores him probably know who i'm talking about but mm-hmm. We'll plug Manny. Manny's a great guy. <laughs> Thanks, Manny. Anyway, he... For all he, you've done. I mean, he saved my life, really. Yeah, he's helping people out right now, I know. Manny and Ben. And uh, he steered us to a lawyer in Iowa immediately. First, get the ball rolling. Called Glenn in Iowa. And uh, Glenn got the videotape from the cop. It's me in plain view using my blinker to pass the, the SUV in question. And the blatant action of the police officer trying to hide that footage from the video but not really knowing how his equipment works because it's silent for 30 seconds and then it clicks on and that's when he pushes the button obviously to record and says that car didn't use his blinker so the next thing the next thing on the cam is 
car on the side of the road with the blinker still on, basically. <laughs> this is what's happening there. Well, it showed the whole 30 seconds of me passing the car with my blinker on. His buffer allowed that 30 seconds to be on the tape that they sent to mm-hmm. us. So, all right, game changer, we're in command. When and how fast are you going to give this $100,000 back to us? So they come with an offer for 90. So like, you know, we're already talking with our lawyers about a 1983 action because we already exposed them as lying and having no case. And, you know, there's a big sigh of relief. But in the meantime, I'm living in my van and sleeping on people's couches and working in the hills, trimming, trying to get my life together. And it, it was just, it's enough to drive you crazy, you know, when, you, when you're used to just living a comfortable life. Yeah, you just come off a great winning streak. You know, like, everything was yeah, looking good. Everything was looking up. I feel like I was cast into this role by, like, a higher power or something to do something. Don't, don't put that down. Pass it over oh. to me. It's just so good. I'll fire it right back up. There you go. Damn. Do you have the this lighter? Or I got a lighter over here. All right, cool. Damn, this one's good. You know, if my Uncle Mike's listening, man, you would love this silly putty. That is Damn, good stuff. For some reason, I'm just thinking about you right now. Nice. <laughs> and then, you know, the silly putty is just like just scratching the surface of the strains that we've had. No, I, I can't wait to try the new ones that my friend has. Damn, dude, this is so good. We're talking about cross. We crossed it with Korean lavender, 98 Bubba's. I don't know. The list goes I mean, on. It's, but... it's just so syrupy. We're down to the roach even. And it's just <laughs> still so good. Yeah. You're whipping the cops. You got the upper the hand course. at this point. Okay. So we we take the 90 grand back and leave 10 on the table for them because mm-hmm. we've already talked about 1983 civil action, which is suing the police for wrongdoing and restitution mm-hmm. for all the spiral effect they just right. caused on my life. So, right, you know, I right. find myself with no friends and, you know, oh, you have friends. Well, bro, you know, I have on. friends, but just let's face it. Like, you know, nobody wants to be around someone that's just tormented all the time. Yeah. You know? yeah. So it's like it's kind of like that. So, like, you know, I'm on my own, but these are demons that I have to deal with. So we got the upper hand in this situation now. And, uh, you know, not too many people go after the cops after they've been wrong. Right. You know, I, I was kind of forced to get the ball rolling to pursue the money back. You were on it, dude. I remember, man. Well, Every, everybody's like, man, shut the fuck up, John. I was like, <laughs> go, John, but go. It, when you say go, it's like, if I don't, if I don't fight back, I go to jail. Oh, dude, you were, you were such my hero at Probably that time. for like three years. Yeah, right. Three for, different. For, for having 15 grand in your pocket. I mean, is that a crime? 15 grand? And I, don't t- I mean, I don't know if it's a crime or not, but I mean, you well, know. Your poker play is 15 grand, you know. And I want to quote my friend Mandelbrot, who was like my biggest supporter through all of this. I don't know if you know him. Though. No. Mac Mandelbrot, another breeder that's like very well known in Southern Humboldt, Mendocino circuits. And uh, I owe him a lot. He was like, when I told him the story, he's like, 15 grand? He's like, tell him to kick rocks. And he like kicked ground he's like yeah you have to fight them he's like mm-hmm. you're gonna win and uh so you know i kept that like yeah they were just banking on you not to fight back well you know if they wanted that to be the situation they shouldn't have raided my home because i have to fight back to stay out of prison now and i'm being falsely accused of things and they're trying to tie money that's in iowa mm-hmm. on a poker trip to the garden i have in my house in humboldt that's completely scripted Mm -hmm. and less than 99 and i'm not breaking any laws there so the whole thing seemed to me like a frame job and it just it it made me so angry that you know like even though i'm forced to fight back i'm like enjoying it at this point to just get some justice out of this because the stress they caused me it all like kind of messed with my head a lot because As we're leaving the detainment, which they detained us for like five hours while they ripped apart our car and everything, we had to go pick up some phones because they took all our electronics. And uh, and I see the the Boston Marathon bombing on the TV. Like, that just happened just then. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? Like, you know, I was just detained at the Department of Transportation for five hours, but there's bombs going off in Boston, you know, Mm -hmm. from terrorists, like real criminals. And it was tax day, April 15th. It was like, it's really weird. And then like a few days upon returning from 
that god awful trip that ended that way the news breaks about snowden and the nsa and he blew the whistle on the nsa and they're spying on every one of us and here they have my devices you know verizon and you know it just comes to light that everything's going into a data bank somewhere and you text something that's not ever gone it, that is retrievable like you know, and people should know that. Like, they're they're watching everything. So that scared the hell out of me even more. I'm like, wow. And I'm going to jail. And like, it, was, it was just horrible. The paranoid thoughts start to come through your head. You know, right? like, I deserve justice from this. So, like, we left that 10 grand on the table with the intent of suing them. And then, mm-hmm. you know, unfortunately, I had a stroke throughout all of the craziness like my brain just snapped man that that stroke was kind of necessary in my life kind of to i don't know because there was no direction except that hospital bed was a nice place to rest for a minute and then try to get my shit together getting my shit together required two brain surgeries in october of 2013 and then fighting this battle for three years that just got wrapped up one year ago like 13 months ago, right before Christmas last year, it was finally wrapped up. And uh, the the best gratification I got out of it was what Lost Coast Outpost printed. I could read it if you want to hear it. And like it sums up the whole thing. And I wasn't looking to get rich out of the lawsuit or anything. I was just, I was looking for exactly what they wrote, you know, just that, and that we won, you know. Well, man, you were, you were my hero and are my hero for that like for standing up you know you were a little guy and they were they were just robbing you and and stand up to corruption like that like that takes like just an incredible set of balls you know and i guess that's what makes you such a good uh a gambler <clears throat> you know i wish I, had more, <laughs> I wish i had more balls on the poker felt than i do you know <laughs> yeah but, uh, but you're right. It took balls to no. To it do totally what I took did. balls, dude. I mean, because I could have stopped when they let me off. Almost everybody, every ninety nine point nine percent of the people walk away. And they're like, you "Take the fucking money. You know, I don't want the goddamn hassle." They gave me you the know? choice. They're like, "It's gonna be freaking tough, man. You already had a freaking stroke. You're right. You sure you're up for this?" I was like, right. "You know what? I thought about it. I remember it. I asked you too at the time, and you're like, dude, I'm just fucking broke. Like, what do I gotta lose?' You know that that right? you know what I walked away with was my exactly my fifteen grand in the end. That's it. You know, the lawyers got the rest. There wasn't a huge payday, mm-hmm. but there was a victory and. I want to uh, quote Mandelbrot that I mentioned earlier, and he kept telling me, he's like, once I got the ball rolling and I decided to sue, he was all for it. He's like, but remember this, John. He's like, if you lose, we're all screwed, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> so he's like, you have you gotta to win. win. He's like, you have to win right, this now. Right, he's right. Like, because he's like, there's a lot riding on this now. It was. Because like the story went global, so they 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 disbanded the the police department or something over this, right? Yeah. Like, tell me, tell me the consequences of all this. You won. Do you have a lighter? Let me hit this. You won. And what happened? Well, uh, what happened? Oh, well, the interdiction team that screwed us over on the side of the road they got disbanded pretty much as the story hit, and that was Shaboom. the Lost Coast Outpost story, but. They wanted to, they, they actually contacted the Lost Coast Outpost in, from Iowa and said, we just want the record to show that that had nothing to do with them winning the case. That right. They were like, they were actually disbanded back in February. We right. just want you to know it's a coincidence. Right. <laughs> so, we won't we, take that. We laughed at that. So, yeah. But, um, you know, things have loosened up. For Americans, as far as like people, innocent people getting in the crossfire of that uh, civil asset Searching. forfeiture. Yeah. You know, because the cops were, were taking that shit like way too far. Like, just not mm-hmm. even, no crimes charged to people. Mm-mm. They were just strictly in it for the money, and the company was training them to do it. I'll leave their name out of it just because out of respect for them, because, and, you know, fear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get it. But, you know, we exposed it, and we got senators like Rand Paul and Grassley out of Iowa, both Republicans, and um, New Mexico was the first one to change their law, I believe, basically get do away with civil asset forfeiture like that. Like, you know, charge someone with a crime if you're going to take everything they own. 
And um, so it, it got recognized. And it's one of the few issues in politics where you see uh, people crossing the aisles to work with each other, Democrats and Republicans, actually. You know, and like there's a fear of sessions and Trump trying to reinstate that. And I do believe they brought it up. But, you know, they were met at the past by people like Grassley and Rand Paul, who they all have a lot of respect for. And, you know, um, it it was brought to Eric Holder's attention. and He changed the law federally and said the feds were going to stop taking the kickbacks that the states were giving up to them when they confiscated people's stuff. They didn't want any part of that. We opened their eyes. You know, and there's a lot of minorities that fall into the category of being robbed on the side of the road by police. They don't have the means to fight back. Mm -hmm. Like the little guy, and they're profiting off it. And it's wrong, you know. That's not a way to fight crime. Yeah, absolutely not. It's just a way to fund your offices and whatnot. Good for you, man. So... You were getting your ass whipped in 2013. Yep. And that's when you got these strains. Nope. 2014, I continued to get my ass whooped. I had 2013, 14. Yeah, right. Ass whooped surgeries. Uh, right. I remember you had like several surgeries after the stroke. Yeah, I had a rare brain. I had a fistula, and actually, uh, Jessica helped me out with some acupuncture the day before that surgery. Uh, fistula repair is no joke. Hardcore. I had diverticulitis, which was caused from stress. So I had a large chunk of my colon removed, and that made the the uh, brain surgery is like a wine testing. I'll tell you that. Like that, that was tough. So you know, I recovered from that pretty stealthily. And uh, 2015, I took a trip out to Colorado, and that's when my friend gave me the strains. He was like, "I want you to get your life together with these." And uh, I feel like uh, a lot of burdens have been lifted and I'm I'm able to enjoy life again. And, you know, I appreciate you bringing me on here to talk about this. It's a whole new ballgame, you know? And uh, Yeah, it's an awesome story. It was a victory for everybody. Victory for me and you, and you fought the hard fight for everybody here. You know, that's for sure. And, and man, you know, I've been smoking your weed for years and, like, hearing about this grease ball, silly putty combo that, you know, from other places. And I'm like, fuck, dude, that's John, man. I need to get some of that shit. Where is that? I'm happy to be sharing it with you mm. because, you know, I respect your opinion. You're one yeah, of so, uh, highly so, respected people in this industry. Silly putty's great. Cultivation Rescue. Yeah. John Numerziki. Cultivation Rescue. That'd be a good name for a band or a song. <laughs> Grease is the word. Cultivation rescue. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, man. Yeah, I'll hit it again. Awesome, dude. Well, man, what what what's gonna what's gonna happen here? What's what what, what do you see the future here for, for for California and the medical scene, or for 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 you and uh, uh, flower pot genetics? I'm only interested in the small part of this game, you know. We want to we want to put the genetics out there for people and uh mm-hmm. we want to continue to win awards for our stuff and uh that's that's all I'm really about in the game and uh looking a lot about what they're doing in Israel as far as their medical cannabis. Uh-huh. Scene over there. I hear that's booming. Yeah, I know, man. I don't have any Israeli contacts, but if there's any out there, I'd love to come check it out. I do. Get in touch with me. I do know some people in the Spain and Israel scene that are kind of expressing some interest in the strain, but it'd be nice to, like, because in Israel, they're just um, researching certain strains and seeing where that particular strain gets you for medication and curing ailments. So that's kind of... Because I think the sky's the limit medically with marijuana. I think sky. They're, they're only mm-hmm. scratching the surface. I don't even think they know what's in the weed that they can't even test for yet. Right. Like, do you know it? What is CBN? Do you know? I mean, you know, it, it, it's a component of, uh, it's a cannabinoid. And I can't remember if it's what makes you sleepy. Okay. I think it's what makes you sleepy. That's a good thing, you know, right. to That's, have in there. Mm-hmm. Some, yeah. some weed doesn't make some weed you doesn't sleepy. have it in there. 
And, and I mean, maybe I'm wrong. It could be what doesn't make you sleep. <laughs> you know, you know, but, but I, you know, uh, I, I'm not an authority on that, uh, even though I should be. Well, mm. you know, um, I'm, I'm just interested in micro farming, you know, kind of like a micro brewery of beer, just like small farm, whether it be indoor, a little light depth or both, probably both because you want to showcase all your talents, you know, outdoor. No doubt. I'd love to see a little like smoke easy cafe on the, on the plaza where there was a greenhouse on the roof and a indoor downstairs and on the roof oh, yeah totally and you like walk upstairs and you can like buy your weed and some reggae vibes pumping boom 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 and like man the third floor it's all open on the side so uh you pizza can oven up smoke there. out and like it'd be just like you know the smoke could billow out the side a pizza oven for sure it's all ganja pizza pizza mm-hmm. i make a mean ganja pizza mm-hmm only for personal use. Yeah, totally. Dude. That hasn't hit the street yet. Ganja pizza. Take mom. and bake. Take and bake. <laughs> oh, shit. We should fire up some take and bake. But right yeah, now. I mean, you know, like a, a farm like that with a place, you know, people could come sample your stuff, actually get the genetics. Oh, that sounds awesome. Have a dude. meal. I don't know. There could be a restaurant there. I don't know. Yeah, right. But, uh, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm still at the bottom level, so... You know, mm-hmm. I'm reaching out with my strains and, you know, we're looking to get along in the recreational world. I guess that's, you got to jump in there. Yeah, somewhere. absolutely. So, Yeah, man, it's all coming. It's all changing, dude. It's going to be good to see it happen. I think there's a place for the small, per- small farmer, the micro grow. And, uh, you know, that's really what makes the best great cannabis, the best wine, the best food. You know, everything is those micro farms, yeah. little bitty like farm to table places. And, and I, I just really hope we can retain as much of that as possible in this new cannabis industry. And yeah. Cannabis are for everyone. Cannabis everywhere. That's for sure. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, just, uh, that little bit extra flair, man, that just means so much. Dude. Yeah. And, uh, it's a pretty, pretty competitive world out there right now. There's, uh, there's a, the floodgate of, like, I don't know if I'd even look at some of that weed that's out there, by the way. I look at it all, dude. I go, to, I, I, go to, <laughs> I go to places. I, I like buy, I buy samples. I look at it. I yeah. see, I see tons of weed. There's definitely a lot of it looks this good before they harvest it, but then like it degrades quickly after their last 10 days in growth and their harvest technique. Yeah. And, uh, 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 definitely lot. doesn't have the flavor. I mean, it's a lot of work, like, you know, tending to that much to make it look, you know, top shelf all the way through. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not used, to, I'm not on that scale, you know. I don't get out to too many farms, or mm. too many places, but like that's our goal. Like it was really nice winning the award at the Golden Tarp, so I think. We'll probably pursue more stuff like that. I can see it, right? Yeah. Totally I think there's should. a Mendo competition coming up. I don't. You should. I don't know if you've heard about it in April. Uh, no, I should, I should get involved though. Sounds super fucking cool. I'm saying like the prize would be like I guess sponsorship from you know somebody. You know what I mean? So yeah, I don't totally. know if I'll have any cannabis ready by then. But, yeah. Well, definitely. Uh, we're gonna smoke some more weed here before you leave, but. Thanks for joining me today, dude. It's been an awesome uh, conversation we've had here on The Real Dirt. Thank you, Chip. I appreciate it, man. Hey, you you can download this episode and others at therealdirt.com or on iTunes, The Real Dirt Podcast. You can also check us out on Stitcher and Facebook and Instagram. So if you got a suggestion, give us a call. If you want to be on Real Dirt, drop us a line. And uh, other than that, man, stay high. <laughs> Grease is the word. Grease is the word. Thank you for joining me today in the real dirt. Today's been an awesome day in the dirt. Learning about cultivation rescue of my good buddy John Numer. You know, uh, so many people just think about weed as just getting high, and you know, it's just like a glass of beer, and, and maybe it is, and sometimes it is for sure. There's this other level of cannabis that just connects me with people like John 
and you know with, with the universe in general and i know it sounds like esoteric and hippie and whatnot but I, I really do believe that fine cannabis can save the world and when we sit and consume it especially in mass populations of people consuming cannabis man we're gonna meddle the fuck out and that's what we need to do and that's kind of what we uh talk about on today's episode how to mellow out with some great weed so i want to thank john my good buddy for sharing his story uh, being a, uh, a a warrior in the front line of the war on drugs, and uh, man, really like fighting the law and winning. That means a lot to me and so many other people. And I want to thank you for joining us today on the Real Dirt. And uh, if you want to download this episode or others, please go to the Real Dirt at therealdirt dot com or on iTunes, the Real Dirt Podcast. You can check us out on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Thanks again, and as always, stay high. Stay high.